Okay, we're kind of in the home stretch here. Uh, this talk is on surface preparation and painting. And we're fortunate uh, to have uh, really three experts uh, on these subjects here with us to talk. Um, uh, we're going to have uh, an expert on surface preparation from SSPC, uh, somebody from International Paints talking about coatings in general, and then lastly a speaker on um, AESS. So uh, what I'm going to do is just introduce uh, each speaker before they talk, and uh, rather than all three at the beginning, so you'll forget who is what and whatnot. So Bill, why don't you come on up? This is uh, Bill Schaup. He's with SSPC. Uh, Bill joined SSPC in December 1994 as Associate Director. Uh, after SSPC reorganized in July 1997, he was named Director of Operations, where he is responsible for delivery of all products and services for SSPC. Uh, in November 1999, he was named Director of Society Operations, where uh, he's now responsible for all facets of the association. His title was changed to Executive Director in June 2000. So Bill is going to speak to us on uh, surface preparation. So Bill, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I hope everybody in the back can see the slides. I feel like it's like church. Uh, I will try not to preach to you, but uh, you can move a little closer. Um, first of all, um, I start every speech like this. I'm a retired Army officer. Um, I retired back in 95 and joined SSPC. So that doesn't make me an expert in service preparation, but I always say to people that are out in the audience, remember the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that are out there doing and defending our country. Uh, it's very important that you do. I'm not... Uh, uh, please do not uh, take my little announcement there as supporting the war either way. I want to make that clear. But those soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines are doing a very important job. And uh, God bless them all. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about surface preparation as it relates to the standards that SSPC develops. How many of you are aware of SSPC standards? Ah, majority of you are in the audience. And I've got the big red book sitting up here. There's the, uh, all the standards uh, that we, we have, all in this big red book. Many of you know it. Uh, there used to be volumes one and two called the red books. And this is volume two. It has every standard paint, paint specification, paint system, etc., that we develop. So this talk, uh, first of all, I hope everybody does use part of their brain, because uh, this machine is some, sometimes like me. It doesn't uh, use its brain all the time. There's the basic standards that we have, SP1, solvent cleaning, two, hand tool cleaning, three, power tool, five is white metal blast, uh, six is commercial, seven is brush blast. You've probably heard of that one before. It's a newer one. And 10 is near white metal. I'm going to talk about each one of these specifically. Solvent cleaning does exactly what it's supposed to, to what it says. You can get rid of all the oil, grease, contaminants on the steel. You don't want them on the steel because as you do abrasive blasting, there's a chance that you, you literally blast the contaminant into the steel. It's, this is a requirement for all other blast standards that you do solvent cleaning or some sort of cleaning to remove all those oils and contaminants before you do any other type of abrasive blasting. SP2, how many time, how many of you have cleaned your lawn furniture and everything else like that for getting ready to put a can of Rust-Oleum or some other Krylon or some other spray paint on it? Guess what? You're doing SP2, which is basically hand tool cleaning, and uh, you're getting rid of the loose material and giving a profile for that coating to stick. SP3, um, the last bullet there, the second bullet, is a what I call a BFO. That's a blinding flash of the obvious, that a power tool will usually remove more contaminants and coatings than a good old wire brush and a scraper. So 
the SP3 is power tool cleaning. Talking about the joint standards, uh, the joint standards were developed by SSPC and adopted by NACE. And you wonder why did we go 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 10, etc. The second bullet tells you why we did that. And the five specifications we will talk about are the three most usually encountered in the shops. First one is white metal blast cleaning. That's the uh, cleanest surface you can have. Coatings like polyureas or something like that that need a good clean surface, you got to get to uh, SSPC SP5. SP10, usually used for something like inorganic zincs, something like that. That's the level of cleanliness there. Six is a commercial blast. And there's a lot of discussion between contractors, especially field contractors and, and uh, owner specifiers who uh, have a little trouble discerning the difference between six and ten. The contractors are saying, look, I've, I'm, I've been spec'd a six, but when I get down to it, I'm asking, you're asking for a ten, and I'm not getting paid for a, for a ten. Because needless to say, more work, more labor, more abrasive is required for a ten versus a six. And then a seven's a brush blast cleaning, and I'll go over these. Okay, the white metal blast, uh, like I said before, it requires SP1 before any kind of uh, blast cleaning. And it removes all the foreign matter from the steel surface, and it produces the cleanest surface of all the blast cleaning specifications. SP2, 95% of the foreign matter is off in each 9 square inch surface but it allows slight stains in the bottoms of the pits to remain. Like I said, 10 is usually required for inorganic zinc. Commercial blast, less, lesser degree. Foreign matter, 33% of each 9 inch squared surface and an evenly distributed stains. Uh, I want you to take a, a little thing on the note there that to get all the mill scale off a of new steel usually requires an SP-10. The brush blast uh, that I talked about, it's uh, most important there is to roughen intact coatings or if you're going to paint over galvanizing you normally need something like, by, like a brush blast to get it. Again, requires SP-1 for any type of, uh, before any kind of blasting and you might ref hear that referred to as sweep blasting. Reference photographs. Uh, how many of you are you familiar with these little booklets? Okay, uh, I'll have these available for people to look at since we're so spread out. Um, if the people were, if you're in tighter together, I'd pass them out, let you pass them around and take a look at them, but since you're so spread out, I'll have these available for after the talk if you want to look at them. Um, how many are contractors in here? No con, one con, one or two. Okay, I will watch you specifically because every time I do this and when contractors are around, I usually get one stolen. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, but but uh, that's what. Believe it or not, people do five finger discount these. Uh, this is the Viz One. This is the most important. This is about dry abrasive blasting. And I've got some pictures there. Viz 2, if you hear about that, that's evaluating degrees of rust. Viz 3 is power tool cleaning. Viz 4 is water blasting. And Viz 5 is slurry blasting or a mixture of water and an abrasive together. There's the cover I showed you, Viz 1. Uh, what it does is shows you some initial pictures, and I'll show these to you of rust surfaces, you and the specifier agree to what degree of the rust there is, then you and the specifier uh, look at what uh, he says he wants the degree of cleanliness, like if he wants a near white metal blast, an SP-10, then you can agree to that, there's a picture of it in there. Another way to do that is a lot of contractors, etc., make panels 
what they will do, the specifier will say, okay, I want an SP10. They'll get a panel. They'll blast it. They'll agree to that panel as an SP10. Then they can take that panel instead of the book and slap it against the steel and says, yep, you got it or you don't have it. Uh, one thing you got to worry about the panels. Guess what happens to the panels after a time period? They begin to rust. So you need to put some sort of lacquer, clear something to keep as a barrier to keep the panels from rusting, or you're not going to get the original, what you originally agreed to. A lot of people don't do, realize that. We do a lot of training classes. We do the, show the panels, etc. We have to take great care in, in pre preparing the panels and making sure they stay at the condition we want them to. Uh, levels of cleanliness, the white metal I talked about, near white metal, SP6 is the commercial, and the less frequently is the industrial brush off, that's the SP7. Here's the initial conditions that you can see, A, B, C, D, and G. You can see how they go from mild rust to heavy pitting. Then if you agree to, here's a rust grade B, you say, okay, I need an SP6. That's the commercial. There's what you have up there on the right-hand photo, and below that, the SP10, which is a near white metal. Now, like I said, but the contractors, you get into a big discussion, especially field contractors, about the difference between SP6 and SP10. So I hope that you, I can clearly see a difference. You can very well see the difference in the books. If you take a look at condition C, and a 6 versus a 10 there, and G, this is previously painted, and a 6 and a 10 there. There's the cover of the Viz 3 that I showed you. That's power tool cleaning. The important thing there on Viz 3 is it shows three additional conditions and uh, goes into a little more detail, but these are the power tool cleaning visual standards. Floor four cleanliness levels, uh, two le levels that you don't usually see. There's an SP15, it's commercial grade power tool, and 11, a power tool cleaning to bare metal, which would be almost equivalent to an SP10. Here's an example of your rust grades, and there's an SP2, which is wire brush hand tool cleaning. Then you've got SP3 with WB's wire brush. SD is a sanding disc. Now standards for abrasives that are used in shops, AB1, AB2, and AB3, they're in the red books. Let me say one thing else about the visual standards. The visual standards are a reference guide. If there's a discussion on what holds, the written standard, which is in the red book, holds precedence. Because if you go to, if there's a legal argument, reference photographs do not uh, hold up, I won't say they won't hold up in court, but they're not really as legal as a consensus standard. The consensus standard is the legal document. Uh, AB1 is uh, talking about the specific uh, physical chemical properties for moisture contents, etc., on mineral, mineral slag abrasives. Slag abrasives could be coal, nickel, copper slag, uh, something like that. Uh, you could have mineral, could be garnet, or some other type of, of abrasive. The three classes of silica, you've got that based on 1%. Uh, silica, of course, is a big problem because it is a health hazard. Silicosis is where it comes, uh, is derived from silica sand. Okay, previously unused, the metallic braces, brace steel and iron, are the two most common. You've got, you know, round shot, you got, you got your uh, grit, and the grit, of course, cuts faster. The round shot uh, uh, makes kind of a, um, uh, a bevel type uh, surface profile, and you need that surface profile, I'm sure, as everybody knows, for the, the coating to stick. And AB2 is there's got to be cleanliness. You've got to check the cleanliness of the mineral abrasive 
because of, uh, oil can be picked up, lead can be picked up if you're removing lead paint, etc. They've got to be clean or you're just recontaminating the surface. Of course, recycled abrasives, uh, you can use probably a hundred times, shot and grit. But as you go through it, bags of new grit, new shot are put in, and it goes through a recycler, it's supposed to clean it, etc., before it goes back on, because you want the coating to, to stick. A, a uh, most common in a shop is a centrifugal blast machine. Uh, it can go about three times as fast as any kind of hand nozzle blast cleaning. Now, if you do the same type of shop structure over and over again, you can increase that maybe to 10 times as fast, etc. if all your wheels stay the same, etc. Here's a picture of uh, some automated uh, blast machine in a shop. Here's some, here's painters checking the wet film thickness of the top flange. Uh, how many of you have heard of our discussions between AISC and SSPC reference QP3, which is our shop certification program, and SPE is their AISC sophisticated paint endorsement? What we're trying to do is bring both of those together. So a shop that fabricates and paints could have an AISC SPE certification. A shop that paints would have an SSPC QP3 uh, certification. We've been working approximately two years on this uh, endeavor. Uh, we've got the draft is done, the standard. What we're waiting on is public comment. That's required by the um, ANSI procedures. American uh, National Standards Institute, their procedures. So we're waiting comment. Uh, the agreement, we really have in auditing practices, we just agreed that we would audit the same way so every shop gets a fair, even look at so they don't get uh, Santa Claus with AISC nor Santa Claus with SSBC. Either way, it's an equal look. The uh, administrative procedure is still being worked. The MOU is supposed to run out uh, somewhere this month. I saw Roger Fretch, who, if I said that correctly, who's my counterpart at AISC. He and I have agreed to keep, keep going, so we get this for the good of an industry, one standard, one type of certification, so they're equivalent, and so the owners don't sit there and say, do I need to pick SPE or do I need to pick QP3? So with that, you always try to finish on a little with a little humor. Uh, here's some good-looking bridges uh, that uh, we've picked up along the way. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any around here. Of course, that's in a foreign country somewhere. You can tell by the sign. A great example of personal protective equipment by a worker. That's a hell of a hard hat. Another great shot of a bridge. Needs some work. I think they need to load limit that one. Oops, it didn't work. Here's my favorite. This is, this is every painter that you ever see on an industrial job. See, he's smiling. He's just happy with what he's doing. But of course, no fall protection, no personal protective equipment, etc., etc. So we call him the happy painter. Another great example of personal protective equipment. And lastly, my welder, uh, who's, who's there with uh, one, one, one hell of a face shield. So uh, with that, that uh, concludes my discussion. Again, the book and the visual standards will be available. Uh, take a look at when we're done. Can we have those pictures? Say again? Can we have those pictures? Oh, uh, give me your card. I'll e we'll email them to you. Anybody want the pictures? Oh, I've got some good ones. I mean, we've got one from Kentucky. I shouldn't say pick on poor Kentucky. Anybody here from Kentucky? Okay, I can pick on you. Okay. We got one great one from Kentucky when talking about low limits. Here goes a mobile home across the bridge and it fell through. And so the only thing, you know, the wheels are down through the bridge and the mobile home sitting there. I guess it's ready for occupancy, leveled and everything. Okay, thank you very much. Remember the soldiers. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bill.
Uh, it's amazing how some of those pictures get around. I'm from Canada, and I think about three weeks ago, three weeks ago, I got some of those same pictures emailed to me from, thanks, from some friends. So now you've heard about surface preparation, and um, Bill is going to be available if you have, if you want to ask him questions after. And then at, at the end of all our speakers' presentations, uh, once the third speaker is done, uh, certainly we'll have time for some questions as well. Our next presenter is going to be Andrew Smith. And I'll introduce Andrew. Uh, so you've heard from an expert in surface preparation. Now you're going to hear certainly from an expert in coatings. Uh, Andrew graduated from the University of Queensland, Australia in, uh, in 1984 with an honors degree in the field of organic chemistry. Uh, early in his career, he worked in quality assurance as a quality assurance uh, chemist, later as a project chemist. And in 1989, he joined a uh, coding company which is now uh, part of the parent uh, company that, that uh, owns International Paints. In 89 he joined them as a research chemist and was involved in, the, in development work on anti-corrosive coatings. In 1994 he was appointed to the position of technical manager heavy duty uh, coatings and in this capacity was responsible pr for product development and technical support. Uh, within the company. In March 2001, Andrew was appointed technical manager, international protective coatings, and that uh, in that capacity covered India, Southeast Asia, and China. Uh, in February 2007, he was relocated uh, to International Paints in Houston, where he now uh, resides to take up the role of technical support director, protective coatings, North America. So, come on up, Andrew. Uh, Andrew has also prepared handouts. Uh, there's about 50 of them uh, in the back. So if you want to grab one on your way out, uh, he does have a handout uh, based on his talk. So, Andrew. Now, before uh, if the, the uh, brighter ones of you would have noticed there that I've got 99 slides, but don't worry. I've uh, actually uh, hidden a lot of these, and uh, you won't have to sit through uh, 99 slides. Um, also, Bill's covered very well the area of surface preparation, so I had a bit on that which I can skip through as well, so thanks very much for that. So um, Friday afternoon, after lunch, last day of the conference, I mean, I'm actually very surprised that this many people turned up and the, the word about the, uh, the free beer and the dancing girls at 3.15 has obviously um, reached at least a few of you. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, the use of coatings for the protection of steel both from uh, corrosion protection and fire protection point of view. Our lawyers make us put this on here, so uh, that's a disclaimer. So any, it basically saying uh, if you, any information you want, you should confirm yourself rather than just taking it directly from here in case I've made an error. Okay, um, I don't need to tell you people here involved in this uh, industry that steel is a very, very useful and um, widespread building material, very good mechanical properties easy to form, cut and join, readily available and uh, low cost, well, not as low as it was a few years ago but uh, still um, relatively low in cost and allows great scope and design of structures. Um, there's, no, there's no other way you could build something like that if you, if you didn't have steel available to you. Uh, airport hangar in the UK, very, very large span, um, all done with steel. Offshore oil uh, production facilities also built out of steel. No other way to do that. If we didn't have steel, we wouldn't have these, uh, these facilities. Also, uh, I'll put some photos in here. This is, a, um, this is the London Eye, and which uh, um, we were involved in coating. And uh, we've got a paying, uh, a paying customer there enjoying the ride and the view. And uh, we've got this guy here. I, I really don't know what he's doing or why he's there. But, um, if anybody does any, any ideas, let me know. He does have a rope tied around his waist, I think, so he's yeah, probably pretty safe. So, um, just to diverge for a minute, um, I saw Bill's photos of uh, those uh, situations in Asia where people are doing very, very dangerous things and happy to be doing them. And uh, well, I uh, spent a lot of time in those places and saw all of that going on. And um, just the only point I can make is uh, if that's why it, stuff in Asia is cheap. Um, life is cheap. Their, their labour is cheap. And um, we see a lot of steel coming in from those places. Um, it's all been fabricated, painted by people under those sort of conditions. So maybe keep that in mind. 
Okay, limitations to the performance of steel. Uh, very versatile, but not perfect, uh, not, uh, not uh, infallible. And the two things that I'm going to talk about are corrosion um, caused by exposure to aggressive environments and also lo loss of structural strength um, in a fire situation. Corro in terms of corrosion prevention, we can use uh, coating systems which are a fraction of a millimetre thick. Um, I, I do speak in metric. I'll, Australia converted from um, imperial to metric in 1973, so... Um, I'm having a bit of trouble in the, in the States uh, readjusting myself to stuff that I uh, haven't done since I was 10 years old, so I'm going to talk in millimetres, so if you need to convert it, come and see me later. Um, so a fraction of a millimetre thick can pro provide very long-term corrosion protection, and um, different coating types, slightly thicker coating systems, uh, can prolong the life of steel in a fire situation. Um, the benefits, you can achieve these benefits at somewhere around 0.1 to 0.3 of the total project cost. Um, and imagine a, a steel structure without any corrosion protection on it uh, or any fire protection. Um, you can see that, uh, that, that the cost of the coating is truly justified by the, uh, by the benefits incurred. But of course we've got to choose the coating systems carefully and um, prepare the, the, the substrates correctly and uh, apply the material correctly. Corrosion is the uh, process of wearing a substance away under, uh, by chemical action and we mostly think about corrosion of steel um, uh, occurring within the environment. Um, uh, presence of water, salts, that sort of stuff will result in uh, steel corroding. But it's really what's happening here, it's just nature's way of uh, getting to where it wants to be in terms of the, the energy diagram because iron ore and, and rust are essentially the same chemically. Um, so we dig the iron ore out of the ground, we put lots and lots of heat and, and process it, put it into a high energy state that we can use and uh, nature eventually will break it down again to, to where it started. Okay, for, for corrosion to occur we need uh, the presence of water, oxygen and electrolyte in contact with the metal. Um, I don't know if you feel like a chemistry lesson this time of the afternoon. Basically, corrosion of steel involves uh, the line up the top there, which is the, um, which is the iron going into solution, so it's dissolving, and the line down the bottom here is uh, sort of liberating some electrons, and the electrons combine with the oxygen and the water to give you hydroxyl ions, and then that all gets together with a bit more water and a bit more oxygen, and you end up with, uh, with rust. The, the important, uh, sorry, the diagram here, on the metal surface you have cathodic and anodic areas um, um, uh, formed on the surface. The uh, corrosion actually takes place at the anode and the rough, rust forms uh, in between. And this is a typical thing you'd see in cross-section of steel that's corroding. You'd see a pit in the anode sites at the bottom. Anyway, the end result is that you're losing metal. Um, and over time that will actually deplete the uh, structural strength of the steel. Um, Something like uh, figures of up to 200 microns per year can be lost um, in aggressive atmospheric environments. If you've got chemical, uh, other chemical factors involved, uh, acids, etc., uh, that can be much, much greater. That's general, talking about general corrosion there, but pitting can actually um, occur at a much faster rate and lead to perforation of the metal, which is uh, quite often disastrous. The corrosion products themselves don't really do anything. It's not like a... Uh, cancer or contagion or anything like that—it just doesn't doesn't look very good, and it can it can interfere with uh, with coatings if you um, try to apply over corrosion. Here's an example here: uh, beam. You, you, you see this a lot in um, chemical facilities. The bottoms of the beams, not a very good design. It's held some water and, and material in there. Um, quite often, you'll see that you know 90% of the beam is okay. Uh, sort of the column is okay. Um, and you've got corrosion at the bottom, which means you've got to you know, replace the whole thing. So. Here's another, I like this one. Um, you can actually see straight through this column here. Uh, that's in a chemical plant. By the use of coatings, we can slow or delay the corrosion process, um, and we can uh, achieve this over many, many years by using uh, the correct type of coating system. And if we use a coating system of about 320 micron, microns, we'll give a um, protection for upwards of 15 years, you know, even in a very, very aggressive environment. 
and uh, we use the standard ISO 12944 when selecting coding systems. How do coatings do this? Um, barrier protection, basically keeping the water, uh, the oxygen and the electrolytes away from the surface. Inhibitive protection, things like zinc phosphate primers, um, also used. Uh, but the real workhorse in terms of corrosion protection is, are the zinc rich primers, both the zinc silicates and the uh, epoxy zincs. And the important thing um, here is that the, the, the zinc sacrifices itself to the steel so it corrodes preferentially and uh, we see this in uh, it, it prevents the corrosion from spreading from points of damage. Uh, typical coating systems, we use a primer, a build coat, and this is essentially to provide film thickness and barrier properties. Um, and because the, these, these are generally epoxies, these build coats, because they have uh, quite poor UV durability, you actually need something on top to protect that uh, epoxy coating from uh, breakdown. So the, the finish coat's not only to make it look nice, it actually protects the epoxy underneath. And uh, it's a little diagram there, typical thickness. Um, uh, diagram here of how zinc rich coatings uh, do their job. If you get a damage to the coating film, um, the zinc corrodes preferentially and you get zinc corrosion products will actually uh, act to fill up, that, uh, fill up the damaged area there. And this is a... Uh, uh, photograph of a panel that's been in, uh, it's had a scribe put in it, it's had uh, intentional damage made to the, um, to the coating all the way through to the steel. We put it in a salt spray test, B117 salt spray, and you can see that the, the, there's no rust there and in fact the scribe is filled up with the zinc corrosion products. That's the same uh, primer with, a, with an epoxy top coat over the top of it. So that's been through the, um, the salt spray testing as well and there's no rust running out of there. So the zinc is protecting very, very well at the area of damage and there's no spread away from that. Um, using ISO 12944 to specify coding systems, uh, we need to know uh, two things. Basically, we need to know how long we want the coding system to last and how long, what uh, length of corrosion protection we require. <clears throat> and we also need to know what the type of environment is. Um, the durability, the ISO standard uses three durability ranges, low, medium and high, and these are based on uh, industry experience and general consensus within the industry of this, you know, this, uh, 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 real life cases. Uh, this is how long these um, systems can be expected to last. <coughs> um, low was two to five years, five to fifteen years, I mean that's a big, that's a big gap in there, but there's a lot, in, in the real world, there's a lot of variation in environments and very, very difficult to predict accurately um, how long something's going to last. This is um, life to first major maintenance and signified by uh, breakdown to level RI3 from ISO 4628. So that's RI3 there and that's roughly 1% of the uh, total surface area is actually affected by corrosion. This is a slightly larger photo. Uh, we look at the environment, uh, we look at uh, the corrosivity ca uh, categories um, used in the standard and there's a scale C1 up to C5 um, and there's C5I which is an industrial environment and C5M which is a marine environment. And obviously the corrosion rates increase uh, as we go down that list. These, this sort of corrosion rate would be something like one micron a year in, um, in thickness loss and as I mentioned earlier about approximately um, 200 microns in these very uh, aggressive environments. There's also some immersion categories there, but um, talking about atmospheric corrosion today. There's plenty, uh, if, you, if you look at the standard, there's information on the metal loss rates, <coughs> and there's a lot more examples of um, the types of environments. And um, the standard contains uh, several tables in which uh, the um, is it there the, is it basically the environment versus the lifetime and um, this really summarises down into this table, this is quite useful, something I use all the time. Um, if you just pick the environment, the, the C1 essentially you don't need coatings for corrosion protection. Um, and you look at the various thicknesses uh, that are required to achieve those uh, lifetime to first major maintenance. Interesting one here. Um, <coughs> 
can use zinc primers in C5I environments and C5I industrial environments, um, things like coal burning power stations, etc. The main corrosion factor there is in the acidity of the sulphate, um, uh, well, sul eventually being sulfuric acid. And zinc doesn't actually work very well in sulfuric, in sulfuric acid environment because it dissolves too quickly. So possibility there for C5I environments not to use um, zinc and use zinc phosphate primers instead. Just got some um, example specifications here. Uh, there's an airport, uh, actually an airport in Australia, and it's a C2 environment, and we use a coating system, 160 microns thick, and that will give us long-term uh, durability. C3 environment, mild urban atmospheres, uh, there's a sports stadium there, and some, um, some uh, wind, wind generation towers and that system is 200 microns thick. C4, moderate industrial and coastal atmosphere, so this is a, a port machinery and, and a bridge. <coughs> For long uh, high durability on that you need 250 microns with a zinc primer. And C5I, um, industrial pollution. We've got a system there that uses a, an epoxy zinc phosphate primer and a total thickness of 335 microns to give you the 15 years durability. There's a the marine environment and see here we've used the zinc rich primer in the same thickness. Application of protective coatings. Um, airless, airless spray is definitely the fastest and most economical method of applying protective coating systems to steel. Very high throughput rates. Um, <coughs> Um, to allow you to, but the faster you can put the paint through the pump, the, far, you know, the faster you can coat your steel. We do see uh, other methods being used, and um, there's quite a few facilities in, in India and places like that where labour is very, very cheap, where they'll just set 100 people with brushes and paint a whole a new power station. That's uh, quite, quite incredible to see. But uh, they're, they're very slow, uh, very slow generally, labour intensive. So we normally only use brushing and rolling for small areas like repairs. And there's, uh, there's a guy um, applying some protective coating system by airless spray. Fire protection. How are we going for time then? Why does steel require fire protection? Steel doesn't actually burn, but when it gets to about 400 degrees Celsius, sorry for the metric again, uh, it starts to lose its strength. Um, and when you get to 550 degrees C, it's lost approximately half of its strength. And these, uh, these temperatures are referred to the, the critical core temperature. Um, in offshore environments, there's a safety factor built into this, so they actually use a 400 degrees C, whereas most of the land-based materials we'd, we'd use uh, 550. And that's a uh, representation there of the, the loss of steel versus loss of um, strength of the steel versus temperature. <coughs> Two basic. Categories of fires, um, hydrocarbon and cellulosic. Now hydrocarbon is um, obviously uh, oils, fuels, uh, flammable gases, etc. Uh, and the other, cellulosic, which is um, things you'd see around here, things like furnishings, carpets, um, um, other building materials, uh, they produce a, a fire curve. If you, set, if you light a fire inside a building, this is the, like I say, it's a standard curve for the increase in the temperature. So the cellulosic fires, they, the rate of heat up uh, is not as fast as a hydrocarbon fire and it doesn't actually get as hot. So a hydrocarbon fire is very, very aggressive, very rapid increase in temperature um, and going up to about 1100 degrees C. And it's important to understand that, these, that the type of protection uh, pro uh, required in these two different situations is, is different. If we... Um, take this cellulosic uh, fire curve uh, and we uh, do the test in a furnace. We can program the furnace to, to increase in temperature at a particular rate. Um, put some steel in there and you'll find that in about 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes, you'll be up to the critical core temperature where you're starting to lose strength in the steel. In a hydrocarbon fire, you get to your critical temp core temperature of 400 degrees C in, in less than five minutes. So. Five minutes in a hydrocarbon fire, that structure is going to start uh, start start the process of collapsing. 
this is a summary in, the, in that table. The impact of this, of course, is that uh, the, eventually the asset will collapse and it may, apart from destroying the asset, may uh, um, have an effect on any uh, people working in that environment. Here's some uh, photograph of some fire damaged steel. You can see these beams are very badly, uh, very badly bowed. Um, another photo here is a uh, fire in uh, Madrid in 2005. You can see all of the steel around the around the windows here starting to, to lose its shape. And of course, the uh, probably the most famous of all that, that those buildings collapsed essentially because the steel in the core was uh, softened by that. Uh, by the fire that occurred. That was a hydrocarbon fire. So we talk about fire protection. What can we, uh, what can we do about this? Um, what we need is to be able to slow down the, the heat transfer of the, um, from the fire into the steel itself. And that just gives us some more time. So more time for, the, for people to evacuate the area and uh, more time for the fire to be extinguished before the, the building collapses. Fire protection methods, um, active systems such as sprinkler systems, foam and deluge, and what we call passive systems, um, which uh, include intumescent coatings. And I'm going to talk to you about intumescent coatings. Intumescence means to, to swell up, and the, the mechanism uh, and subsequent char formation absorbs the heat from the fire and insulates the steel. <clears throat> the mechanism itself has a finite lifetime. It can only be, only be effective over a certain period of time, and that's called the fire rating. If you see in these specifications, they'll have a, um, a fire rating stated in the, in the building specification. Uh, it's the diagram here. We've got a beam with an intumescent coating on it, uh, exposed to fire, and it will, uh, the coating swells up and forms an insulating char. There's a photo there. I um, don't know how well you can see this, but this is our, one of our test ovens with a column and test, and that's before the fire, before uh, before the heating, and that's after the heating. This the, the uh, materials swell up. So what does this do? Um, here again, we have our standard temperature curve. Uh, that's the furnace temperature. That's the steel temperature unprotected, and by using an intumescent coating, we can um, vastly prolong the time it takes to uh, to reach the critical core temperature. And you see that little bump there, that's, that's a bit over 200 degrees Celsius, Celsius and that is where the uh, intumescent reaction starts to kick in. So here we've got about 60 minutes before we reach the critical core temperature, so that system would have a rating of um, 60 minutes, fire rating 60 minutes. Uh, specification of um, fire protection systems, um, unfortunately a lot more complicated than uh, specifying for corrosion protection. and most methods usually uh, need to include the um, consideration of the section factor, which is basically uh, uh, the concept that the, the heavier the steel, the more heat you've got to put into to bring it up to temperature. So heavier steel requires less fire protection than lighter steel. Fire safety obviously covered by regulations at many, many levels, and quite often we see uh, additional requirements, requirements by uh, owners or insurers um, that are uh, above the uh, uh, regulatory requirements. There's various testing and certification bodies uh, worldwide and really all we can say is that we need to examine each case, case by case, and look at the fire protection requirements. There's the, some of the, uh, the, the, the organisations involved in uh, um, specification and approval for cellulosic fires and for hydrocarbon fires. And of course, all of these, all of these um, standards seek to solve the same problem, but of course, they're all slightly different. There's not, you know, there's, they use slightly different temperatures and slightly different oven setups, and it's uh, standardisation in this area would be uh, very well welcomed. And we get loading tables published. So, for a particular product, you can go to UL online, and they'll give you a table of uh, thicknesses required. <clears throat> it's an example here. Um, if we look at the, the the thickness required versus the section factor, we see that uh, the heavier steel this is heavier steel at this end, so it's got a smaller surface area to volume ratio, requires less fire protection. 
application of intumescent and coatings, um, sim basically similar in most cases to applying um, standard anti-corrosive coatings, however the viscosities are much higher, so we do tend to use specialised equip equipment. Um, one, one important factor of intumescent coatings is that we have a relatively low film thickness and so you can actually ma maintain the shape of the steel, <coughs> which is important in some situations. Epoxy intumescent coatings are also very res resistant to handling damage and so uh, makes them ideal for off-site application and transport to site. And some situations, some specific um, specifications require the use of mesh to reinforce the film in the event of a fire. <clears throat> Here's a typical system with a uh, column, primer, uh, the fire protection, and between we, the fire protection is applied in two coats, and between that we, we apply a um, carbon fibre mesh, and that helps to hold it together in the event of a fire. Not required in all cases, uh, just in certain particular areas. Um, spray equipment, there's an airless, an airless pump. Uh, which has been modified with a um, uh, push plate to handle the, uh, the um, highly viscous material. That's a single component airless, so all, all the, you mix the material in the can first and then put it under the, the pump. And this is a much more sophisticated dual component setup. And so you just it, very similar to the photo where it was applying protective coatings, uh, applying a, a fire protection by airless spray. And that's the beam being loaded onto a truck. Just a, a few notes on surface preparation, and I, again, I thank Bill for uh, covering it so thoroughly. Steel, we see the steel beams here, and you can see on that very bluey grey colour, that's, that's mill scale on the steel. Um, where it's been lying outside in the water, it's sort of rusted in the corners, and it probably, if it's if this steel's been imported from China, uh, it's probably been on an ocean voyage, so there could be salts and whatever lying in there. So uh, very important to remove all of that before we attempt to coat it. We're going to remove the mill scale, remove all of the surface contaminants, and create a surface profile. Um, my former boss of mine said, you only get one chance to paint steel properly, and that's when, you, when it's new, when, when, you, when you're constructing the building. Uh, so abrasive blast cleaning, uh, very important in that regard. These are the, uh, the surface preparation standards we typically see for new construction jobs. Um, this is quite rare uh, outside of the chemical industry where they're trying to get very, very clean steel for tank linings. Those two are by far the most common. Um, Bill did mention the surface profile, and there is two types of profiles. One's like a peen surface that you get with shot. The other you get with, um, with uh, grit materials, angular materials. And we get much, much uh, greater surface area to achieve adhesion on the um, angular profile. You can measure the profile with a profile gauge. Uh, abrasive blast cleaning equipment, uh, fixed equipment. For example, the wheel abraders, and people have got to stand in there, I saw that. Um, <clears throat> these are automated, very good for straight, regular pieces of steel, um, beams, plates, etc. Uh, not so good for unusual shapes. Um, next on the list of blasting booths, so it's in a fully enclosed blasting um, booth uh, which re recycles the grit. And the last option is uh, open blasting, and open blasting is becoming uh, very, very difficult to, to achieve anyway for, for health and safety reasons. And uh, there's a guy blasting. For field connections, we take the steel to site um, and we bolt it together, weld it together, whatever we do, and you'll always end up having to, having to do some painting on, on site. And methods typically specified are SP2 and SP3. <coughs> and uh, if anyone's ever actually tried to remove rust and mill scale with a, with a scraper and a wire brush will know that it's very, very hard work and it's very slow and it doesn't tend to get done very well. Um, the big risk is polishing the surface, which uh, will affect the adhesion of the coatings. There's, uh, there's a hand wire brush and a, a power brush there. Also a needle gun. This uh, needles um, come out, uh, alternate and coming out. It's air powered. And you can see that if you can get into corners with that and create a, 
get the steel fairly clean, but also very, very hard work, noisy and not very pleasant, so it tends not to get done all that well either. Um, zinc rich coatings in particular require, require a very uh, clean steel with a sharp angular profile to, to guarantee protection and um, the only way uh, to get this um, apart from blast cleaning is to use this SSPC SP11 standard. <clears throat> this is very difficult to achieve. It's, uh, you're getting the, the steel totally clean with a power tool and that's quite a hard thing to achieve. Um, you can use needle guns and sanding discs, but really only suitable for very small areas, well margins, that sort of thing. But there is some new technology becoming available now, which we've uh, seen a lot, of, a lot of interest being generated in the industry, called a, a bristle blaster. And it's essentially a wire brush, but it's got a kink in the bristles. And there's a little, little lug there which um, grabs onto that, that bent section pulls it back and then the, the bristle actually flicks down onto the surface. So it's rather than just brushing the surface, you're getting impact. And um, this gives you uh, very, very clean steel with a profile suitable for applying even um, zinc silicates to. We've used zinc silicates over this. So in summary, uh, coatings can be useful in extending the durability of steel in certain situations. Um, we can provide long-term corrosion protection and we can use uh, ISO 12944 to select the coating systems. Intumescent coatings perform a valuable function in delaying the loss of structural strength in the event of a fire and various standards exist by which we specify intumescent coatings. Adequate surface preparation is required uh, to ensure performance of the coating systems and we've looked at various surface preparation methods. Okay. Thank you. We'll do the, do the questions at the end of the session. Okay. Okay, our final speaker is uh, Todd Elwood from AISC. He's a regional engineer with them uh, out of Chicago, although this is part of the area he covers, so uh, he gets around. He's going to be speaking uh, on AESS, which is architecturally exposed structural steel, and uh, certainly some of these concepts will be tied together in, in his talk. So. Go ahead, Todd. Good afternoon. Uh, th first, uh, my name is Todd Awood. I'm the Upper Midwest Regional Engineer with AISC. Um, and I want to thank you actually for um, giving the opportunity to actually speak today. And also thank you for uh, coming to our conference as well. Um, a little background on myself. I I attended the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana and I have a uh, bachelor's in architecture and a master's in structural engineering, um, both from that university. Um, after graduation I worked at Tang and Associates for roughly around three years um, in their building construction department uh, and ended up doing um, building di design for several structures across the, the U.S. Uh, I joined AISC six years ago and have been a regional engineer for the past two years. Uh, the states I cover are Michigan, Indiana, um, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia. Um, so I probably spend more time at O'Hare flying out or trying to fly out than pretty much anywhere else. Um, with that, we've already heard about surface preparation and coatings. Um, and even before you get to both of those things, you get to the structural steel itself. Um, so the, conversa the presentation today is, for my portion, is architecturally exposed structural steel. So when you walk out of this um, presentation today, I hope you take away one thing is how to end up specifying it. You have the idea of your expectation of what that final product will be. Um, and what AIC has really tried to do is help the engineer realize how to translate that to the fabricator and helping the fabricator to be able to discuss that with the engineer to end up having both parties um, satisfied with that end result. So before we start on that, there's two obviously um, divisions in, with structural steel. You end up having structural steel that is um, governed by the code of standard practice uh, which AIC produces, and then you have the code of standard practice for the architectural metal industry. The code of standard practice 
um, defines this in section 2.1. Um, and it says that structural steel um, governed by the code of standard practice will consist of the following items that you end up seeing there. Um, so it is the overall building system uh, that actually supports and holds that up. Um, 2.2 states what is not included in AIC's code of standard practice. It ends up being such items as cold form products, um, cables, castings, and items such as those. Um, the, the aspect I want to really talk about today as well as is what the code of standard practice covers. Um, if you've looked through uh, the section that's covered with AISC, you start to notice that it's actually fairly limited in its, in its scope. Um, it goes into, um, in 10.2, to s certain simple things um, in regards to specifying uh, specific members. You're not going to specify an entire building as AESS. Um, utterly impractical. Uh, you need to actually start to really think about the, your building um, and what it's end up being used as. Um, if you have this example, it's an opera house in Santa Fe. You can actually see the image at the top that the roof structure ends up being exposed. But when you take an image of the, at the top of the roof there, you end up seeing that connection for that, the bracing and so forth. And when you zoom in, you can see the welds. And, you know, they're not the most attractive that you're going to end up finding, um, but they're doing their job. And at the same point, um, you very well could specify this as AESS, but it's extremely impractical for the fact that no one's going to see this other than maybe some general maintenance and so forth. So the idea of specifying that is really doing harm to your client because it's spending a large amount more money um, for no really good end use. Now, if you take this building, it's uh, the British a pavilion in Seville, Spain, Seville, Spain. You can actually, well, to go back, uh, you can end up seeing the vertical trusses that are um, supporting some of the fa facade. When they end up coming down to the, the base, you can end up taking a look at the welds, and um, they still provide the same strength and um, stability that we need, but um, more attention was um, paid to their aesthetic nature. And this is a p point where you would end up needing to identify AESS for the fact that your building occupant is actually going to be able to walk up to it and interact with it, be able to touch it and see it. Um, so this would be the ideal uh, area where you end up needing to specify that. Um, now when you get into the Code of Standard Practice 10.2, it starts to define what the tolerances are with AESS according to AISC. And pretty much what they come down to is reducing um, the general tolerances by a half. Which, uh, well, and, and also in the regard, um, you would presume then that they would end up uh, specifying two uh, welding conditions and so forth. But um, welding is not, um, you know, no special treatment is provided in there. So if you need your welds ground smooth or, and want that visual, then you end up needing to spe specify that separate from um, s just specifying it as AESS according to our code of standard practice. Um, in 10.3, you end up with the fa fabricator providing special care um, in regards to transferring it um, and shipping. And also in 10.4 is erection. Um, the erector ends up needing to provide special care in order to um, eliminate and uh, minimize damage that can end up being seen from um, erection throughout the process. Well, the big thing that we were seeing in the industry is the fact that you have this disconnect. Um, you have engineers specifying according to the code of standard practice um, and expecting that that end result is going to end up being um, this seamless, sharp, welds ground smooth, um, very, very tight fit up um, for your, your AESS applications. Um, but that really isn't the case. Uh, so you had uh, these four groups that you see on here end up getting together um, because they realized that this disconnect was out there. Um, the engineers really weren't communicating with fabricators and vice versa. And so once that those projects um, around the country started to be fabricated, um, really taken off in, in the 80s and, and 90s, um, 
people weren't getting what they really wanted. So these organizations got together to try to assist not only the designers and fabricators, but also to provide costing and other information to the contractors um, to start to provide a resource to the industry. Um, and AIC also tried to help in that, and we've actually been publishing um, they actually produce a guide, which I forgot to bring up here, um, which hopefully many of you have seen, um, which is this, the ASS uh, brochure on AESS. Um, and what it combines inside is actually a sample specification as well as uh, images from a uh, sample board that we have. And I probably could have brought it, but it's about 75 or 100 pounds and not the most convenient thing to uh, transport across the country. But in this brochure, then it goes through the sample board and we're gonna go through several of these images um, today as well to kind of show the difference of what you can end up expecting um, and what you end up needing to specify on your project. Um, certain things that it goes into is um, do you need your weld ground smooth? And what is that really gonna end up looking like? Um, and then most of these examples and go through what it's gonna look like once it's painted as well. Um, another big thing is contouring and blendings of weld. Um, HSS is starting to really grow in the industry um, and being used more and more and it's used heavily in AESS applications. So how do you end up having that the connections and so forth um, detailed and designed out. And what kind of images do you want that to actually show? Another big thing too is um, fillet welds. Uh, do you end up having continuous fillet welds? Uh, typically you don't end up needing, needing them to be um, and can have them stitched, but that may not be what, you know, the aesthetic regard that you want out of it. Um, another thing is just minimizing the weld show through as well. Another aspect too is, um, as you can see with the typical blocking, um, you end up, the, the tolerances can be um, a little larger. So if you end up having um, an AES, AESS application, um, you may need to actually minimize those. So you can end up having the coping actually be tighter um, so you don't have as large gaps. The other aspect that a lot of people end up uh, forgetting as well is piece marks as well as mill marks. Um, most products, uh, all the products that end up coming out of the mills end up being stamped. So it may be the situation that um, they are gonna be visible and you may not want that. So you may need to actually specify to have them removed in ground before they end up being painted. Um, the Another aspect to also remember too is um, if your AESS happens to be actually within range of um, the occupancy of the building, being sh be sure to end up having the sheared edges ground uh, smooth. Uh, they can end up being sharp and, and so forth and that's the last thing you're gonna end up wanting to happen. So the other aspect too is field aids. Um, once you, if you have to have any kind of um, erection in the field itself, you, these may be necessary. So, you know, the architect engineer may want them to be removed. So that's another situation to uh, pay attention to. And as was already covered, different finishes and so forth. Um, it goes through, and obviously, uh, these are two interior finishes. Um, which don't show the best in the PowerPoint, but to give you kind of an idea of um, what we've already discussed too, uh, multi-coat systems um, and two additional exterior ones. Now one of the most important things in the brochure itself is the costing information, um, which is in the very back of the brochure. And also I have a couple with me, um, so I'll actually lay those in the back as well. And if you would like one, um, you know, or stop up here and grab one after the presentation today too. The, how this um, matrix was actually set up was all the items that we just actually went through are highlighted um, in this and it goes through each specification um, to note those items. So you end up going at the top, you have special care, um, down to welds ground smooth and surface effects, mill marks and, and, and whatnot. Um, it also goes through um, 
different of the SBC classifications and so forth that was already covered, um, as well as just some idea of um, finishes, high end, low end, and um, et cetera. The key point with this matrix, um, which is probably one of the most important things, it goes through um, all these items that we've covered, but then it also breaks them down into specific categories. You end up having the standard uh, specification according to the CODA standard practice, but then it goes above and beyond that and says, you know what, if you are category one, which ends up being the occupant, you know, can not only be within 20 feet of um, seeing that, but actually being able to physically touch it um, and interact with it. Well, you're going to end up having to have the highest level of all these specified. Um, the next one ends up going to um, if it is within 20 feet. Um, obviously, the occupant is going to be able to, to view it much easier and so forth. And the level um, category three ends up being above 20 feet. So obviously your building isn't going to be just one, you know, category one, two, or three. It's probably going to actually be a range um, because if you end up having, uh, say, steel in, in a lobby, it's going to end up probably going from the ground up to the top of the building. Um, so it's the fact that um, knowing what the application is um, and, and how that's going to end up being used to actually relay this information um, through your construction plans into the detailer and the fabricator. Uh, we just had a um, so something kind of, I received a call last week um, from a supplier uh, and they supply castellated beams. Uh, they were being used in a gymnasium and the engineer didn't realize that uh, when you end up producing a castellated beam, you end up cutting it and welding that back together. Well, the welds were you know, they weren't ground smooth. Um, so there was a lot of discussion going back and forth of, you know, the, they really wanted the welds ground smooth. But the situation was the beams were going to end up being, you know, supporting the roof of the gymnasium and they were around 60 to 70 feet in the air. So the occupant is not going to actually notice that, that weld. Um, so it's really trying to put it in perspective of trying to provide the client that the, the best service, the most realistic um, experience because of the fact that to actually go back and grind all those welds smooth, you know, you're not really not the best use of time or money. Now this, now this actually goes through um, surface preparation and um, coating systems and I would say this gives you a, a good idea of cost um, uh, and percentages but really the best source would end up going to an industry expert. Um, so contact your coding, you know, coding supplier, coding expert, because they're going to be able to give you the best um, cost information. The, and the other aspect with this, it breaks down um, these, these several categories and gives you an idea that, you know what, if you're in category one, it is going to be, you know, 100 to 200 percent you know, increase in cost um, to do AESS. So when you are specifying it, you know, really look to what, you're, what you need. And you don't end up needing to do, um, say, everything in category one. That may not suit you. And that you end up with, on this far side, um, this kind of the general, well, which you can't really see, but it, the area in blue, which is kind of user defined. You have a lot of instances where you know, you may not need to do all those things, but you may want your welds ground smooth. Um, so to end up specifying, and it goes on this far side where each of those items in that specification actually are broken out to give you an idea of how much that's going to end up costing for each individual item. Um, and finally with that too, um, this document is actually on AIC's website. Um, so I encourage you to visit that, as well as a Steel Solution Center, which um, hopefully most of you may know. Um, they were actually down in our booth today as well. A uh, great aspect of AISC where if you have questions um, in regards to ASS fabrication design, you can end up calling or emailing um, to end up getting an answer, typically within um, 
eight hours to, to two days or so uh, for a response. And it's a free service uh, to the industry as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually turn it back to Greg. Well, uh, would you join me in thanking each of our presenters for, uh, for their preparation and sharing their industry knowledge with us. So uh, we, we have some time for questions. Uh, so I'll just open it up. If uh, you have a question for one of our speakers, Andrew, Bill, or, or Todd, uh, now's your chance. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll let Todd uh, answer that. Did you hear the question, Todd? Could you repeat the question, please? The shimming for... Um... Actually, that is a good question. And actually, I don't know. I haven't actually ran into um, that aspect before. So actually, I don't have an answer for you. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it's a, sp a specific AESS requirement. It sounds like an erection tolerance for proper fit up. Any other questions? Well, uh, with that, thanks. Oh, one question. Sure, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, the, the question is, uh, in, in schools, as an example, some project documents come out requiring structural steel that's going to be enclosed within walls or whatever, so it's not visible. Sometimes that comes out, you're seeing bare steel is fine. Other project documents ask for that to be painted. Is that correct? Yeah. And why? Any? <laughs> you, well, actually, I can go ahead and um, AISC doesn't actually require for steel to be primed. Um, that's really actually up to the design professional in that. But if it is enclosed within the building, we don't see why it needs to be primed. So, no. As, as, because you're actually, um, you know, depending on the architect, actually, that the building enclosure actually is, prevents any kind of moisture, any kind of water infiltration into it that would end up, you know, starting corrosion. That, yeah, that could be a situation too, but it kind of, it comes down to then the design profess, professional, you know, specifying that too. And, and sometimes in those situations, you may, you may not know what's going to happen with it, so. Okay, well, our speakers will be up here for a few minutes if you wanted to approach them and ask them a question yourself. So thanks very much for attending. Thank you.